So, have you ever had a frustrating day where nothing just was going right? And you couldn't figure out why things were happening wrong and everything was just going haywire and just things were that way. Maybe this is a common occurrence for you. Maybe it's something that happens every once in a while. Maybe there's just a little thread of frustration underneath everything that sometimes crops up and you, you learn how to deal with well. But I think the reality is each and every one of us at one time or another, whether often or not less often, becomes frustrated. It's part of the way, the, the way we deal with things. There's a problem, and when there's a problem, we get frustrated. Especially when we can't fix the problem. See, frustration is an indicator that we care about something. It's an emotional reaction, realizing that this thing is important to me enough that I'm going to become emotional about it in some way. Frustration is natural, frustration is normal, but we need to learn how to respond well to this emotional red flag that comes up. We respond to it in a healthy way when it, when it arrives, so we don't say, well, I can't be frustrated, and I try to push away my frustration. No, frustration is what happens. But the question is, what do we do when we become frustrated? How do we process it? How do we work it out? So that's what we're going to talk about today, and I hope I don't get you frustrated by what I'm saying. Um, so we're going to look into the Bible uh, at Numbers chapter 11. We'll jump through a variety of different verses here just to kind of get the, the gist of, the, of what's going on here. And this is a situation that I'm sure um, you've dealt with in a similar way, and it's something that Moses deals with here, and we're going to go through it section by section and talk about it. So we're going to start with the problem, and the problem leads us to the passion, and the passion leads us to the prayer, and the prayer leads us to prophecy. So we've got some nice P's going on there. It's a cool pastor thing that sometimes people do. I don't do very often, but it just worked out this week. So, so starting with the problem, this is the introductory problem that Moses is dealing with in Numbers 11, chapter 4. It says, The rabble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also went again, and they said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up. There's nothing at all but this manna to look at. This is the situation that Moses is facing. Someone's coming to him with a complaint, and not just one person, but many people. And it says the rabble among them had a strong craving, and encouraged the Israelites in this way. We don't know who this rabble is. Some people say it was some grumbling Israelites. Some people say it was some Egyptians that kind of slipped into the crowd and made it all the way there and started stirring things up. There's no real indication of who the rabble was, but it was this rowdy bunch who was causing trouble. And if you know anything about a troublesome bunch in a larger crowd, oftentimes people gather the troublesome bunch. This is how mobs are created. This is how uh, large rallies get larger followings. This, this thing is going along and passing along, and someone looks and goes, what's happening? And they turn and they see, and they go, oh, yeah, I'm kind of frustrated about that too. I'm going to go join. You know, I wouldn't start this myself, but now that someone else has voiced it, I'm going to go join what's happening, and I'm going to be part of what's happening here. So that's what's going on with these Israelites. So a few of them start mumbling and complaining, and then it becomes more, and it becomes more, and it becomes more, and it almost sounds like whining children. And Moses almost feels like a parent who's being whined at. And as a parent, we want to teach our children how to correctly respond to a situation when it's bothersome, when it's frustrating, when it's troubling, instead of to whine about it. The children learn by example. Sometimes when they're in a situation where there's rabble around them, they learn by that example. I know many people who said, my kid was just fine, and they went to school, and they came back, and they're doing all these things, and complaining about this, and talking about this, and I don't know what's happening anymore. Because they were introduced to other people who were doing things that way, and talking that way, and dealing with things that way, so they thought, well, let's experiment with that. Let's see how that works for me, right? And so it's part of this learning process. And sometimes it will be more difficult, sometimes it will be less difficult. But this is uh, sort of what Moses is dealing with here, is the, these Israelites have 
realize that maybe they could complain. This rabble has decided this is a good idea, and so they're doing so. And oftentimes it's reflective of us as parents when this happens. We see or hear about our child doing or saying something, and it feels like we've failed in some way as a parent. Because they shouldn't be doing that. They should know better. I should have been able to teach them better. And all these types of things go through our brain, and then we become emotional or we become frustrated because of a situation outside of ourselves that we feel that we should have some ability to control in some way. So our emotional reaction to something indicates our passion for it. And I believe everyone who's ever had an emotional reaction of any kind to their child has a care for their child. Sometimes we don't react emotionally very well. Sometimes we do. But the reality is if, we, if those emotions are coming up, that means we care and we need to know how to deal with them well and how to travel through that. <clears throat> so if you care about your children, their problems become your problems. If you care about fashion, let's say, you can't help but tell everyone where all their wardrobe malfunctions are to help them out, right? Because it's something you really care about. If you really care about hockey, let's say, you can't help but get frustrated at the poor playing or the bad coaching or the other guy who believes that his team is better than your team and that's just a source of frustration. So you have to argue about that until you decide who, who has the better team, right? These are all things that we can be passionate about. And we can get frustrated about things as well when they're things that we care about. And Moses cared about his people. He was displeased and he was angry at the Israelites because of his passion for them. We continue on to see Moses' response to what's happening here in verse 10. It says, Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, all at the entrances to their tents. And then the Lord uh, became very angry and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, why have you treated your servant so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay this burden of all of this people on me? Did I conceive of all of these people? Did I give birth to them? That you should say to me, carry them on your bosom and as a nurse carries a suckling child to the land that you promised an oath to their ancestors. Where am I to get meat to give all of these people? For they come to me weeping and saying, give us meat to eat. I'm not able to carry this people alone, for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way you are going to treat me, put me to death at once. If I found favor in your sight, and do, uh, do not to let me see my misery. <clears throat> we could say safely that Moses was worried to death about them and their problems. He feels like the chicks in his nest are screaming for food and he is entirely helpless to provide for them. And so he goes to God, frustrated, complaining, emotional, saying, God, why is this burden so heavy? Why am I dealing with this? Why is this happening? I don't want to do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. If only I were dead, I wouldn't have to deal with this. This is an emotional response. Some of us may have gone through all these steps. Some of us deal with emotions in a different way. But the reality is that when we have problems we face, it stirs up the passion in us. It stirs up those emotions. And we go through those things. See, we would sleep through life without problems. We wouldn't care about anything. We wouldn't do anything. It would just be... Coasting along, coasting along, and it, there wouldn't be any flavor in it, I would say. Because it is the very fact that the problems are there that wakens us up to the things that we should care about, and the things that we do care about, and the things that drive us forward in life. They lead us to want to solve problems. This is what they call the engineer's mindset. Where you have something, or you have a problem, or you have a situation, oftentimes with a machine, that's what's called an engineer's mindset. And you want to try and figure out how to solve this problem. Whether you need to design a new part to go in this spot, whether you need to move some parts around to make this thing work, how do you do it? How do you fix this problem? And this is a mindset that is in every human being. 
Some of us do this with machines. Some of us do this with people. Some of us do this with all sorts of things. How do I fix this problem that I'm in? How do I get through this? And when we can't figure things out, we get frustrated. See, frustration is not the problem. The problem is how we deal with our frustration. Here's some reactions, some common reactions that people do, things people do when they're frustrated, and they fall in two categories, and then I'll add a third one. Um, the first one is withdrawal reactions. This is a way when a situation is so frustrating and so difficult, we just we can't do it, we can't figure it out, we just leave it alone. We back away. One way we do this is through a fantasy or escapism where we... We take ourselves out of the world entirely and put ourselves into an entirely different world for a time just to forget about the problem. That could be going and watching a movie and just kind of soaking in that space and pretending you're part of this cast of characters and being there for a while. It could be playing a video game. It could be reading a book. Anything that will take you outside of your current life, your current world, and put yourself into some other space because you just can't deal with what you need to deal with right now. Another thing that people do is called repression. That is what I would call self-inflicted amnesia. Intentionally forgetting something that has happened to you or is happening to you because you just don't want to deal with it. So if you forget about it, you won't deal with it. And the second category is aggressive reactions to frustration. Some ways people do this is they displace their anger. They blame themselves. And they're angry at themselves and they're frustrated at themselves. And it might not even be something they had any control over. But they think it's all their fault, right? So they're angry at themselves. Or it could be projecting their anger onto somebody else or some other situation that isn't even necessarily related to what's happening. And so they have this source of frustration. Instead of doing that, they go over here and go, well, this is, I don't know what to do with this. But I'm going to lash out at this person or lash out at myself. Just something to get this emotion out, because I don't know what to do with it right now. That's the other way, or other category of dealing. And another subcategory of this is suicide. Some people turn to suicide when the frustration is just far too much, and then they're aggressive towards themselves. And if we look at Moses' reaction here, he has a very aggressive reaction to problem. He says, God, it's all your fault. You've put all these people in my bosom. You've done all this to me. And why are you treating me so poorly, God? When who's actually done this? It was the Israelites complaining to him that caused the frustration. And now he's blaming God for it. So he's projecting his emotions. And then he says, I wish I was dead. He has a little bit of that suicide piece in there. I just wish I didn't have to deal with this anymore. This is Moses' natural reaction to the situation going on. But there's another piece of the puzzle that the uh, secular psychologists won't put in their fancy lists, uh, that Moses is also including in his list, and that's what I would call the prayer reaction. That when something is frustrating, we turn to God in prayer. And yes, Moses is showing his true colors. He's showing his aggressive reaction to what's going on. He's showing his frustration, but he's not just showing it. He's telling it to God. Moses gets frustrated. He responds but then he allows God to speak to him to get some help for what he's dealing with. So our problems lead us to our passion, and our passion leads us to prayer. Prayer is realizing that we need help. Passion is good. Reaction's normal. But sometimes we just need a little direction or redirection of our impulses. Turning passion into fuel to solve the problem. So I want to turn to James chapter 5 for a minute, um, just to talk about prayer and sort of when we should pray. Because it's easy to say, you can pray. You just pray about anything at all the time and just pray without ceasing. These are easy words to say. But when should we pray? How does this work? James 5, 13 says, are any among you suffering? Oh, they should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of the faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. 
Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. And the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Then it tells a story. Elijah was a human being just like us and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and for six months it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth yielded its harvest. So what do we do? When do we pray? When we're suffering, when we're sick, when we're having crises of faith, when we have a a gripe with someone else, we go and we forgive each other and pray together, confessing our sins to one another. And maybe when we need to shut up the clouds for a while, we can pray for that too. My favorite verse in this whole section of verse 16, the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. It's not just something that is part of this equation we're creating here today. It's not just the next step. It's not just something that we feel we should do and then go on with continuing to be frustrated. It's powerful. It's effective. Because the one we are praying to is powerful and is effective. So pray for, pray with each other. Go to the elders of the church, have them pray for you. Confess to and pray for each other. Pray as a community and build each other up to relieve this frustration. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt like you didn't know what to do and you had to talk to someone about it, right? And you go and talk to someone and people, all these people gather around. Maybe no one has really good advice about it, but just being in that supportive space with everyone else and knowing that they care for you is a help in itself. And God is part of that community equation. That when we enter into this space and talk to people and pray together, we are together saying we want to be here with this situation together and encourage each other and turn to God in this way. And that's what Moses is doing by himself. And then we'll see in a minute a bunch of people are invited into the scene and then they're joining in this activity together. Uh, Well, let's turn back to Numbers. Numbers 11. We'll go down to verse 16. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their place there with you. So God is now realizing that Moses has said he can't do it alone. He's voiced his situation. He's voiced what's happening. And God said, why do you feel you have to do it alone? There's all these elders that are already doing things with the people. Why don't you gather them in, bring them in, and pray with them? Bring them into this space where you are here with me. So you can encourage each other and you can work this out together. Uh, Verse 24 says, So Moses went out and he told the people the words of of the Lord. And he gathered 70 elders of the people, and he placed them all around the tent. And then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him, took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. But they did not do so again. Our problems lead to our passion, drive us into prayer, which leads to prophecy. What is that all about? Prayer empowers prophecy. See, once we're open to hear what God says, once we're in that mindset and that space of prayer, then he speaks to us. Passion, our own internal passions need to be directed and need to be stilled a little bit so that we can be open to receive the direction of God and then God stirs us into action. See, prophecy is the action coming out of our passion and out of our prayer. Speak, it's about speaking directly about and into a certain situation and into a certain problem instead of withdrawing from it or becoming aggressive towards it. We're speaking directly at the thing that we need to deal with or someone else needs to deal with and saying, this is what needs to happen. God has given me direction because I was enough to be open to him. And he stirred up my passions and directed them in his ways. And now he says, we should do this. He says, you should do this. He says, the world is going this way and we need to go that way. This is the way that prophets speak when they come into a community. 
but they never come in willy-nilly. They never come in with their own agenda and just say things and leave. They come in with their in heart intent in the right way to know that what they're, what they're saying is what God has first spoken to them. Oftentimes we can hear the word prophecy and it sounds like this weird sort of hokey, hocus-pocus experience that someone might have. We don't really know what to do with it. We don't really understand where it goes or when people talk about how they've received a message from the Lord or they have such and such a prophecy about some end times thing that might happen and we just think, oh, that's another crazy person, right? That's another person saying whatever or doing whatever. Just ignore that person. And the funny thing is that whether the person is an actual prophet from God or a false prophet, as we say, trying to mislead people, the human reaction is the same to the person. Because a prophet will never come in and tell you exactly what you already know. Because why would God tell you what you already know? God sends prophets into a situation to tell people what they don't already know, what they should know, maybe what they sort of know underneath but they don't want to deal with. And he sends them in to let it out and say, look, this is the situation. This is what we need to deal with. This is what we need to do. And that can get people frustrated. Because we all have things we don't want to deal with. We all have things we don't want to face. And when someone says, you need to do this, we say, oh, don't listen to them. No, that, that doesn't sound right. No, we don't really want to go that direction. And so prophets come in, say their piece, and move on. I heard someone say, they like being a, uh, what's it, a pulp, doing pulpit supply better than being a pastor of a church because they said they can come in, they, that, how they say it? they can blow in, they can blow up, and they can blow out. So they see some, they, they, they hear from God, what, what does God want, want me to say to these people? Because I don't know these people, I don't know their situation, I don't know what God needs to say to them, and God tells them what he wants to say, and they come and they say it, and sometimes people get extremely offended at what they said. They said, it's okay, I'm leaving next week. I don't have to deal with the emotional fallout. That may be as easier for some people, but it is a calling for in some way. That there is a need for sometimes people to come in and just to say something and to bring something to the attention of a community, of an organization, of a gathering, and then leave and let them work it out with God, right? That is the way that the prophets, if you look and read some of the prophets, the minor prophets and the major prophets, that's the way they often did things. They came in, they did something, and they left, and then God worked within their community, and the prophet went and did something else somewhere else. It's a very hard life to live, because everywhere you go, you feel like you're just stirring up people's passions, and then you leave and, and you just get people frustrated all the time. But that is something that we all deal with, something that we all face. But I want to point out something very important. There is a great difference between speaking passionately about something within a gathering and prophesying. There's an incredible difference, even though they sound the same. And the big difference is that step in between we call prayer. You can be extremely passionate about something. You can come into a situation and say things into that situation. But if we have not come to God in prayer first and let him redirect our passions according to his will and his ways, then we're not prophesying. We're just saying what we feel and what we believe strongly about and hoping someone will change their mind based on our own opinions. And it may sound similar. It may sound the same. We can even say, God told me, because we said a quick two-minute prayer before we walked in and said our peace. But did God actually tell you? Are you actually walking in line with the will of God in this respect and prophesying to these people in the way that God has intended? Because that's the big difference. Is our heart in the right place? Because if our heart is not in the right place and someone's offended by what we say, then they're offended at me. And then I take that personally. And then I'm more frustrated and they're more frustrated. But if it's something God has said and we come into a situation and they get offended at us for what we said, we say, well, I'm sorry, but that's what God told me to say. And then move on, right? Knowing that God is the one who has our back. Knowing that God is the one who's saying these things through us and then we don't take the attack personally. We don't add to the frustration by becoming frustrated ourselves. We say, this is what God has told me to say, so I say it. And then I let God work with it. 
And that is the big difference between just speaking passionately and first being directed by God and then actually speaking prophetically into situation. Passion without direction leads to all sorts of problems, but passion with direction leads to solving problems. We saw some of those sorts of problems that passion without direction leads to in the list of the ways people react when they're frustrated. Each and every one of those things are ways we react, ways other people can react when we stir these things up without proper direction and guidance from God. To move on, to close the verse off here, <clears throat> we see verse 26. It says, Two men remained in the camp, and one named Eldad, and the other named Medad. So a lot of dads in there. And the Spirit rested on them, and they were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent. So they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And jo Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. And Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on all of them. It's a very interesting response. See, prophecy can get us into trouble. No one likes someone who speaks against something that's happening. We say things like, don't listen to them. That's just the way we do it. Everyone does it this way. That person's crazy. And a really annoying prophet will be made to feel unwelcome. Like Joshua comes in here and says, make them stop. Get them out of here. They shouldn't be doing what they're doing. They shouldn't be saying what they're saying. It's just causing trouble. But Moses says, if we're honest, realize everyone should be prophets. And what does he mean by that? Where does he go with that? What is the sort of direction he faces? Let's read the verse again. He says, would that all of the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And if we jump back in the verse uh, to verse 25... It speaks about that very thing. It says, when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. So you cannot prophesy unless the Spirit has first rested upon you. You cannot first prophesy until you have met with God, He has spoken with you, and then you say things with His direction. And Moses said, I wish more people were like that. I wish everyone who says they follow God would come to God. Because how can you say you follow God if you don't come to Him for direction? It's a very, almost a prophetic statement that we can read today and go, wow, that talks about me. That talks about my family. That talks about my church. I wish everyone, including myself, would come to God so that His Spirit might rest on them and he might be able to speak to them. And that is my encouragement for us today. That is my wish for us today, that each and every one of us would be in a space to be open enough for God to have his spirit rest upon us. When our passions are stirred, when our frustrations are getting to us and we have these natural reactions, we all know what they are. When I read through that list of the, the normal human reactions of frustration, I went, oh, that one's me, that one's me, that one's weird, I guess that one's not me, I wouldn't do that. But these ones definitely I relate with, that's definitely my normal reaction to frustration. And it's good to be aware of. Because then once we notice those things in us, we go, oh, well, it's coming up again. That means I'm frustrated. So now I need to deal with that well instead of doing my normal reaction. My normal reaction is to withdraw from things, to leave the situation entirely, to go and play a video game so I don't have to worry about it, to just stop thinking about it and go for a walk. Whatever it might be, any of those withdrawal reactions, I'd fit in all those categories. Because that's my normal way of dealing with things, is just not dealing with them. It's not helpful, it doesn't get anything done, but it's my normal reaction. So when those things come up, for myself, I need to say, oh, okay God, I need to talk to you about this because I'm getting frustrated and I need your help to know, to know how to deal with this emotion, what to do with it, how to work through this best. And we all have our normal reactions. 
But the question is, do we make sure to take that next step? Do we make sure to go to God in prayer, to let him speak to us, to let him redirect our passions and use them as fuel to do his work instead of letting them blow up? Prayer is an incredibly important step in this process. That God's Spirit might rest upon us, and we might go out in His Spirit, say the things He wills us to say, and do the things He desires us to do. So I hope whatever the situation, whatever frustrating situations come your way this coming week, that, that we can remember that to take that step and say, God, God, I need your help. God, I feel frustrated. God, I feel tired. God, how do you want me to deal with this? What do you want to say to me? And then take the time to listen. 